Hello folks, the time has come and this is likely the last or one of the last content pieces I am going to do. After that I will be mostly retired as a content creator. Yes, very sad. Anyway, it got me thinking. For the goodbye I like to do a somewhat casual analysis. 2022 hasn't been the best year in terms of geopolitical world events, but for tech enthusiasts it has at least brought exciting new product generations. In the x86 land AMD launched AirPal. Intel launch AirPal and I think AirPal is quite a bit better than AirPal overall. Arguably even more exciting was the GPU box ring with the launch of Nvidia's newest Ada Loveless generation manufactured in a 5nm glass node from TCMC called 4N and AMD's newest RDNA 3 microarchitecture which self-proclaimed offers the most advanced GPUs using chiplets. Nvidia executed mostly flawlessly, Ada Loveless made a huge jump forward in all aspects bit performance, efficiency, feature set or consumer prices. AMD wasn't so lucky with RDNA 3, they significantly missed the initial goals in regard to performance and performance per watt. In addition the software also leaves quite a bit to be desired. The original plan was apparently an average game clock of 3GHz and higher instead of 2.5, while not consuming more energy. The chiplet approach would guarantee small and high yielding 5 nanometer graphics chiplets while the 6 nanometer memory chiplets would not only be very cheap to produce but also be used for another GPU chip as well, saving overall design costs. In AMD's ideal world they would have beaten the 4080 in rasterization performance by a significant margin and wouldn't be that far behind in ray tracing cases, at least not on average for current applications. The 384-bit GDDR6 interface with 24GB and the rumored 3D stack capability for extra cash make it also rather clear that AMD was shooting for the stars. Sadly for Team Red, they are barely faster than 48 in rasterization, badly beaten in RT, consuming more or way more energy for the same tasks and are overall spending more resources on the product. 3D Center, a German website, made an excellent launch analysis looking at the reviews of many different outlets. Performance and performance per watt is well covered. But how is the performance per square millimeter looking like? For first overview let's look at area and transistor numbers. AMD did achieve an impressive transistor density of 152 million transistors per square millimeter with the GCD, packing nearly as many transistors as Nvidia's AD103 in less area. 45.7 billion in 300 square millimeters this is 45.9 billion in 378.6 square millimeters. Compared to the N7 predecessor Navi 21, that's nearly a 3 times density improvement. Even one 6 nanometer MCD chiplet with 5 to GDDR6 memory and the GCD achieves about 6% better transistor density than N21 did on average. The full configuration requires in total 525 square millimeters, resulting in about 110 million transistors per square millimeter a bit behind Nvidia's monolithic 5 nanometer class designs. Now, inside that GPU a lot of different components are present. Physical interfaces to external memory, in the case of Navi 31 also between dice, there are multiple multimedia engines for video decode and encode using a lot of SRAM cells together with the display engine which also drives multiple display files to the outside world. So an interesting question is, how much of the dice actually used by the graphics engine or the compute units? Close to the new year, technology analyzed for everyone did share AD102 and AD103 die shots on Twitter. As one can see, the free and public images are not really high res, but good enough for some high level analysis, leading to this AD102 floor plan interpretation. From a high level perspective, AD102 does follow the layout of the previous GA102 chip. One crucial difference is of course the number of graphics processing clusters which grew tremendously from 7 to 12. In addition the L2 cache capacity got an even larger boost making the jump from just 6 MB to 96, a 16x increase. GA102 plays 7 GPCs in a row with each one including 6 texture processing clusters in a vertical line. AD102 puts 6 GPCs in a row at the top and bottom, keeping 6 TPCs per GPC but they are not lined up as 1x6 anymore but are arranged as a 2x3 configuration. This leads to a wider layout which thanks to many other elements still results in a nearly square like chip. Besides that Nvidia did remove the NV links as the leaked driver entries reported and one display file. Now look at AMD's Navi 31. 
Compared to NVIDIA's 8102 and 103, AMD is spending in multiple cases more total resources per high-level unit on N31. Each shader engine has twice the pixel throughput of a GPC, 32 pixels per second vs 16, 64 texture mapping units vs 48, includes larger register files and up to 2048 working SIMD lanes vs 1536 on the NVIDIA side. Obviously, not all structures are directly comparable and there are a few things where NVIDIA invests more, like in tensor cores or the ray tracing implementation. Those shader engines, respectively GPCs, are the main components which do almost all of the processing work. Now, comparing N31's graphics engine versus 8102, it shows that the AMD chip is using just half the area for it, roughly 164 square millimeters versus 312. One shader engine takes about as much die space as one GPC. This also means that even the 8103 with 7 GPCs may occupy a bit more space for its 3D engine than Navi 31. So just from this perspective, Navi 31 is really a competitor to the 8103 and it would seem like an even battle with both companies achieving similar rasterization performance with similar area requirements. Obviously, this viewpoint excludes the lower memory subsystem and that's where we actually see the big difference in area utilization between N31 and AD103. In general, N31 is using a wider memory subsystem with 6 MB of L2 cache plus 96 MB of L3 cache versus 64 MB L2 cache and a 384-bit GDDR6 interface versus 256-bit GDDR6X. The 6 MB L2 cache from AMD follows a different design philosophy being built with small 256 KB tiles, which do provide a lot of bandwidth and better latency, but lead to fairly bad area utilization relative to the given capacity. 6 MB need about 14.4 square millimeters on N31, while 6 MB with larger 2 MB tiles on ADA only take 5.5 square millimeters, roughly 62% less area for the same capacity. AD103 should need about 59 square millimeters for 64 MB of L2 cache. 4 times more area for about 11 times the capacity, latency, bandwidth and efficiency considerations excluded. But N31's 96MB L3 cache, marketed as Infinity Cache, is built more similar, likely also using 2MB tiles and enjoying much better area efficiency for a given capacity. However, the L3 cache and GDDR6 files for N31 are inside the external MCDs, AMD needs an extra high bandwidth connection to them. This costs about 20 to 21 square millimeters extra on the N5 graphics style and fairly similarly 22 to 23 square millimeters in total with 6 MCDs. And this is just the area overhead for the files, there's a bit more control and interconnection area involved for that. The free cache area with 6 MCDs may take around 57 to 92 square millimeters, the upper bound being not too far off from AD102. It's important to mention here that you shouldn't take some structure comparisons too seriously. The die shots are not great enough to make precise analysis and selections. I was also not too motivated in figuring out what structures inside the MCD are for cache control, memory control and possibly TSVs. So not every comparison is fair or accurate. Anyway, there are likely a couple of questions which many have. How small slash large would be a monolithic 5 nanometer N31 design and how much more would it cost versus the chiplet approach? Also, how does it compare versus Ada Loveless then? I'll tell you. I don't know. Let's try to get a rough guidance at least. Though we have to smear the breads with a ton of caveats. We don't know the precise chip dimensions and scrap line margins, we don't know about the wave on packaging costs, we don't precisely know what we don't know, at least I don't know what I don't know, maybe you know what you don't know. I just entered the dimensions I got from measuring the die sizes on package images, which include some remains of the dicing street slash scribe line. Since we can't be precise anyway, I didn't bother with even trying. So I just use a symmetrical and small scribe line margin for the dimensions. On some chips it's symmetrical, on some others the horizontal or vertical scribe line is larger. I observed a margin of 0.2 and 0.3 mm between two Tiger Lake chips on a low res Intel wafer. On IV22 just the scrap line remains are 0.09 and 0.3 mm long. To get some prices into the mix, I used the values iron cutters slash tech tech potato sauce, though, as he said, those are not precise figures and different customers may get different deals. Other sources estimated a far less steep price increase for 5 nanometer wafers 
in the $13,000 to $16,000 range by $9,000 to $11,000 well listed for 7 nanometer. KISS, keep it simple, stupid, is the name of this game, which is why I only included a price of $14,000 for 5 nanometer wafers in addition. Furthermore, it has to be said that the folding calculations are very chiplet friendly. We assume that a defect is critical and destroys the chip, while in practice redundancies and skews with less strict requirements can improve the yield substantially, so the contrast should be less extreme. Otherwise, for example, the Cerebus wafer scale engine, which is basically a single chip per wafer, couldn't commercial yield at all. For TCMC's defect density I picked 0.08 which was projected in the past for plus 5Q. It may be better, it may be worse, depending on the flavor of the note and implementation details. Long disclaimer short, for N31 the simplistic die per wafer calculation outputs 142 good dies, a yield of 79% for the 300 square millimeter sized N5 GCD. The cost per good die would be between 99 and $120. Doing the same for the N6 MCDs leads to 1563 good dies and 97% yield, costing only $640 apiece. So in total the silicon cost for the 7900 XT, 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 XT would be $137 to $158. But what we don't know is how much the fanout interposer costs and the packaging of the whole construct. Making similar calculations for AD103 leads to $133 and $162 for the monolithic for Endi. So if we would take the calculation seriously, 390 square millimeter for Endi's would cost about as much as one 306 square millimeter and 5 die plus 227 square millimeter and 6 silicon. But again, the critical failure rate for Nvidia's products is most likely better in relative terms, especially since the 4080 SKU is not using fully enabled chips. For a fully enabled AD102 product, we would look at silicon costs of about $255 to $309, nearly twice as much compared to the N31 and AD103 numbers. However, the current 4090 SKU is also not using a fully enabled chip, utilizing only 128 of 144 streaming multiprocessors and 72 MB L2 cache of 96, so the production costs should be significantly lower. Even with the shortcomings of this cost model, let's follow it and calculate what a monolithic 5 nanometer N31 design would be priced in comparison. I make it simple once more, which again is likely favoring the chiplet approach more, as I don't subtract off the potential chiplet overhead. But at the very least, we remove the 12 files, which are necessary between the GCD and the MCDs, saving us 44 square millimeters of our previous total of 533. Just to note, don't wonder about the discrepancies in numbers for the same chips, they come from measuring the marketing renderings, low res die shots, package images, sometimes guessing a margin, and depending on how cute I felt, I took one or the other numbers. That said, in addition I removed 27 square millimeters for the 96 MB L3 cache. While SRAM is not scaling that great anymore, it still does from N6 slash 7 to N5. On Zen 4, the 32 MB L3 cache portion shrunk by 29% versus the 32 MB on Zen 3. I took the same scaling factor for the L3 cache inside the MCDs. So in the end, the monolithic 5 nanometer design would roughly need 463 square millimeters instead of the chiplet total of 533, about 70 square millimeters less. The cost for that would be larger though, instead of 137 slash 158 dollars, the silicon cost for the monolithic N5 die would be 165 slash 200 dollars, 20 to 26 percent more. But AMD would have saved the integrated fanal packaging and gained better energy efficiency and latency numbers for their free cache and GDDR6 video RAM. Based on the simplistic model, the chiplet approach doesn't necessarily appear as the much better trade-off, but I'm not an insider, so the redesign costs are beyond me. Since the 3D engine of Navi 31 is roughly the same size as the one found in AD103, one logical question is how well AMD's chip would do with a leaner memory subsystem going for a more value approach. After all, the N31 memory subsystem could be overbuilt for the clock rates it currently achieves. One could also argue that 20 or 24 GB of VRAM are very unlikely to be a strong selling point versus the 16 GB found in the 4080 products. So, N31 with a 256-bit interface, how would it do in terms of area and potential production cost? 
We start with one GCD plus four MCDs, resulting in 457 square millimeters, already smaller than the conservative estimate for the 5 nanometer monolithic design with a wider memory subsystem. Once again, we remove the files on the GCD and MCD dies, saving us 36 square millimeters. About 4.8 square millimeters can be removed for the small L2 cache, 4 MB instead of 6. Lastly, the 64 MB L3 cache would be smaller, allowing us to subtract 18 square millimeters or so. In the end, the die size of a 5 nanometer monolithic N31 design with 64 MB L3 cache plus 256 bit GDDR6 could be about 399 square millimeters. In the range of the 390 square millimeter AD103 die size, costing between $136 and $165 per good die. Obviously, it depends on how much the performance of the product would degrade to say how attractive this mixture would be. Right now, I would have preferred the value path, as from my perspective AMD is in no position to ask for premium prices. The more you ask for, the less room there is for flaws compared to strong competing offerings. And in that regard, Nvidia is mostly flawless for the majority of GPU customers. This can't be said for AMD at all. FSR2 is inferior in multiple cases compared to DLSS2, like image stability and reconstruction. Moreover, DLSS3 slash frame generation is already out there, but FSR3 should come soon, whatever this really means. Ray tracing performance is still significantly behind Nvidia, together with the H.264 streaming quality. Also, the software compute stack leaves a lot to be desired for many applications. Like Blender performance is bad, Affinity runs terrible on Radeons, AI inference is much faster on Nvidia, etc. Then you have the lackluster efficiency in regard to multi-monitor usage, media playback or partial load, which in some European countries it can accumulate to serious money over time. Some of that was improved by recent drivers, but the list of shortcomings can actually go on and on. With a price tag of around 1000 bucks and more, most people won't spend money on this. Even if the 4080 costs $200 more, or the 4070 Ti the same versus the 7900 XT, that's where the majority of money will obviously go. But there are a lot of customers who can't or don't want to afford premium GPUs, as most of their offerings appear as nothing more than luxury toys, primarily filling the pockets of the companies without providing good value. So in lower price brackets, AMD might have done better, the margin game versus Nvidia's lost anyway. Of course, hindsight 2020, if AMD knew how things would turn out, they might have chosen a different configuration. To really make up for the current production costs and to get into a competitive position, N31 needs to do much better. There are rumors that AMD is working on a respin for N31, improving the physical design implementation, looking at the limiting paths and transistors to get the average clock rates and efficiency heavily improved. There were multiple chips in history, which achieved tremendous improvements through a new stepping, like the half-broken Fermi GF100 design from Nvidia and its small siblings. Achieving 21% better performance per watt and performance per square millimeter. If there's a similar potential for Navi 31, then AMD could turn the boat around. Since a B-stepping would need multiple months to market readiness, such refresh could align very well with other improvements. By then, or for that product, AMD could improve the power management in many different disciplines, utilizing more power states and smarter control mechanisms. Furthermore, most word game issues would be fixed, the compiler for the dual issue capabilities might be a bit better, and FSR3 should also be implemented by some games. Overall, providing a package with less rough edges and which can really afford a premium price tag. It may even reach the point where it makes sense to release 3D cache variants. For the performance per square millimeter view, we have the issue that N31 is using different nodes and chiplets. But I think the monolithic model we used previously is reasonable. In that regard, I assume about 450 square millimeters for N31 and keep the performance profile the same. Let's say latency and data movement improvements are fully transformed into a better performance per watt profile. In this case table, the AD100 free chip would beat a monolithic N31 design by 12% in 4K rasterization performance per square millimeter. Not too much actually, but the 4080 is not using OSMs, so Nvidia has a bit of headroom to increase the difference. The 4090 doesn't shine in this comparison, but similar to the 4080 SKU, it's not using all of the die resources. In this case, Nvidia could enable up to 12.5% more SMs, 144 versus 128, and 33% more L2 cache, the full 96 MB versus 72. Using the obscene 600 watt power target option and performance per square millimeter numbers should look much better. 
If a hypothetical N31 respin could improve the power performance area overall by 20%, then AMD might beat the 4080 in absolute performance by a lot, while being a bit in front in the performance per watt and performance per square millimeter department. However, 20% would be obviously a huge chunk, and that's what's needed to be on ADA level, just for the rasterization perspective. Ray tracing and AI viewpoints would require even more. CPU and GPU battle cycles remind me of the World Cup, where big teams train for 4 years and put blood and sweat into it for the chance of winning the cup, the resulting fame and a bit of extra money. However, the dynamics can lead to astonishing results where a match can turn into a nightmare, quickly taking away the dream of winning. In that regard, I feel for the red team, this was not a lucky round for them and years of hard work will not translate into gaining market share and making more money unless a much better refresh can reposition them relatively quickly. But if this will even happen, it's still open as of making this video. In the end, I want to say thank you to everyone who engaged with me on YouTube, Patreon, Substack and Twitter. It was a fun ride, one which I really loved and who knows, maybe one day I will come back as a content creator. Take care, have a happy life, goodbye.